my intelligence, not by my strength, not by my will, but by God's standard and God's estimation. He says, be subject to your husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is head of the wife, as Christ is head of the church. Now, I'm going to read the rest, but I want you to know something. Jesus is head of the church. Husband is head of the wife. Full stop. The most incredible thing about union and fellowship and oneness is found in the marriage bed. And Jesus takes that and connects that to the heavenly marriage bed, the church and himself. That can't be established in any other thing but the male and the female relationship. We are subject to Christ, men. Our wives are subject to us. It only works in unity and in blessedness if we fall into the order that God has established in his word. Don't try to do a historical study on anything. Don't try to analyze culture. Don't try to call Paul anything. Just look at creation. It's established in creation. It's established in the words of Jesus Christ. God created us male and female. He is savior of the body. I am savior of my wife. I'm to save her. I'm to pray for her. I'm to nurture her. I'm to care for her. I'm to love her unconditionally in the agape way. I'm to love her with eros love and filial love. Every form of love is supposed to out of my heart toward my wife. Nothing less than the best that I can do. And Jesus gives me perfect love, perfect love. And it casts out all fear that I have about saying what I'm saying today. Because what I'm showing you today is love, telling you the truth. I don't know if I'm gonna put this up on the internet. I'm wrestling with that. But I'm telling you, this is the truth. He goes, he goes on to say, but as the church is subject to Christ, so also wives ought to be to their husbands in everything. As the church is subject to Christ, right now, Christ has a will, Christ has a way, Christ has a purpose. He wants his church to come together in unity. And I'm telling you, we are not unified. Competition over who gets more people or trying to have your own thing is what runs the day. Just because I have a small little congregation doesn't mean that I don't seek unity. And just because you have 10,000 people in your church doesn't mean that you get unity because you have 10,000 people. What you're saying to all those small churches that lost their members and went to your more cool church with more programs and more things offer is you said, we're better than you. And I'm telling you, the Lord hates it. We are not subject to Christ on that. I believe that mega church is gonna die because God wants it dead. Why? Because you stole from other churches where people were discontented and disaffected with just having the simplicity of, of a small thing and the community feel. They went for something big and grandiose where they could meet more people, make more business connections, hear better preaching, get involved with something that's bigger, more involved. That's baloney. That's not of God. I'm telling you, God hates megachurch when it's done that way. If megachurch happens like Pentecost, you still have the example there of house to house ministry, daily house to house ministry. I believe megachurch was spread out in distinct cell groups and with leaders and with people who were moving in a small family type way. I think you had to have that in order to have true fellowship. So competition, and the way we're operating in our churches with all the disagreement over doctrine, it comes back to one thing, is Jesus Christ head of the body? Is he Jesus Christ at church? And if he is, he'll connect you with other churches. He will connect you with other people. We want to connect with other churches. We don't want to be marginalized. But when other churches tell us that we can't cast out demons or talk about the spiritual gifts or, or talk about um, what real preaching is, 
you know, versus baby preaching, you know, where you don't even tell people what sin is all about anymore, where you don't deal with the real issues of culture right now, what's killing people right now, when you don't defend those battle lines, then what are you doing? The church is ecclesia, called out ones. Called out of what? The world. Called out of what? Dominion of sin. Called out ones. That's what we are. Called out of having a nice little fun little life. Having a nice little American life. Called out of that to serve Jesus Christ. He's our head. We are subject to Jesus Christ. We are under his authority. He is our head. He made us male and female. He did it, not the Father, Christ. Christ spoke maleness and femaleness, and the Godhead breathed in it and created life. And in that breathing was woman, because God brought woman out of man. So in Ephesians chapter 5, we know that so that the church is subject to Christ. We must be subject to Christ. And then wives in everything. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Why should you listen to Jesus? Because he gave himself up for you. You should study the atonement. You should study what he died for. You should study all of the details of why he had to be nailed to a tree and have his father turn his face away from his precious only begotten son. You need to study that. Sin must be exceedingly sinful. The law makes sin exceedingly sinful. It reveals to us how much we fall short of the glory of God in being created a man in the image of God. The law tells us how dirty we really are. And we always live in the reality that we've been rescued from a horrible cesspool of wickedness. That's who we are by nature. Children of wrath, sons of disobedience, under the power of the prince of the air. We are under de demonic control outside of the spirit and the word, the way, the truth, and the life. Husbands, give yourself away for your wife. Love her unconditionally. Die for her prosperity so that he can sanctify her. That's what Jesus did. He loved the church that he gave himself up to make her pure. He says he's coming back for a church without spot or wrinkle. Homosexuality, wrath, clamor, competition, jealousy, envy, arguments over foolishness, arguments over baptisms, arguments over whether or not there's a Holy Spirit baptism, all of that done. A pure church understands it. A mature church gets it, clueless anymore. And we've gotta move on to perfection. We've gotta move on to the deeper things. We've gotta become teachers rather than always being those who suck at the breast, who are babies that don't want to hear about the stuff that we don't know about. We've got to say, God, give me the whole thing, both barrels. Blast me with your word. Blast me with your truth. Show me if there's any offensive way in me. Show me if there's any evil way in me. Show me if I'm lying or deceived in any way. We do this here. We have to do it. I have to do it. I'm challenged because I am in this place of seeking. And Jesus wants you to know that he's going to wash you thoroughly from everything. If you're seeking him today, you're going to be washed by the word. He says, by the washing of the word. Every part of this is going to wash you. When you expose yourself to the word, it exposes you to your sin. The word washes away your sin. The word. And then the fire comes in and it fills you up with the glory and the power of God. That's what God does. That he could present himself the church, that he might present to himself the church, that he might present to himself the church in all her glory. Are we beautiful? We're not beautiful to God right now. We are not pretty at all. We're a whore. We are going after our gods and we are serving the lusts of the flesh. Stop it. Come back to God today.